I'm Maria Palopoli, and here's my genetics court case. Why do you think that Jen is suing her parents? Tony and Carmela were only doing what sensible parents would have think the point was genetically engineering Jen when it was almost assured she would have athletic ability. I am not going to question the motives of the parents when doing this, but she was modified. What would have if they had genetically modified her in the first place? Why, if you were a parent, which I'm sure many of you probably are, would you ever want your child to go through that? I would have got genetic engineering when I was an embryo. That would have been my dream. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give in the cause now pending before the court to be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I was told that you were informed of this by the Cromo Laboratories. As I might bring up again, the psychiatrist talked about this exact problem, I believe. So, may I call you Caitlin? Yes. Or would you prefer Miss X? Why does epigenetics matter to Cromo? You're a minor, right? Yes. So you need the guardian. Yes. So that guardian would be responsible for you as well as Jen. This percent isn't the difference. That's what's similar. Are the failed procedures what Cromo considers failures or what people consider failures? You seem to consider Dissatisfies customers. Well, it's being yeah. whether or not the yeah, athletic gene affected the artistic gene. What's the chance of that? The chance that we did the that Cuomo did the procedure correctly is a 99.601 percent chance. My fellow lawyer, Mr. Cochran, and my clients. Is that true? No. Yes, <laughs> it is. May we I have it right here. I designed this court case several years ago to help make genetics more meaningful for my students and to help prepare them for decisions they'll have to make in the future. I start the unit by asking provocative questions about the ethical decisions of genetic engineering, then ask students to write an essay on their position. After several lessons on basic genetics, the students choose roles in the court case. This is not a mock trial. Once the students have some basic information, they create all of the evidence themselves. It's the year 2040. Jen Edix, age 15, recently found out that her parents had her genetically engineered to have favorable athletic genes. Jen doesn't care about sports. She loves art and wants to be an artist, but she isn't very good at it. She claims that when her parents hired Chromo Labs to make genetic modifications, her artistic genes were affected. She's suing her parents for emancipation and $3 million in damages. When Jen goes to court, she's going to have to demonstrate, with the help of her lawyers, that Cromo did affect her artistic genes. The parents, or defendants, are represented by their lawyers. Who is in court? Well, Jen Edix, she's the plaintiff, her guardian ad litem, assigned by the court because she's a minor, her two lawyers, the Page Foundation, or People Against Genetic Engineering. They come to help support Jen with their founder, lead scientist, and two lawyers. The parents, or defendants, Carmela and Tony Edix, with their lawyers. And Chromo Laboratories, they come on behalf of the parents, and for their company's reputation, the CEO, lead scientist, and lawyers. The jury. I usually get six to eight jury members, and they're often former students who have been through the case themselves. We have reporters and, of course, photographers and videographers. Once everyone has a role, preparations for the case are underway. I step out of my role as judge when I meet with each group. I ask Jen and her lawyers, what evidence would you need to show that Chromo Labs made a mistake? To the parents, I ask, what evidence would you need to show that you've been good, responsible parents and why you made the decision to have Jen genetically modified? I often invite experts to help students prepare. I like to have a lawyer come visit and talk to the students about courtroom etiquette. Using role play, the lawyer helps the student lawyers learn how to examine and cross-examine a witness. One year I asked my friend Dana Waring to speak. She's co-founder of the Personal Genetics Education Project, an organization which developed at Harvard University. 
Dana updated the students on recent genetic engineering research. When students learned that scientists have identified genes for things like eye color and curly hair, the genetics court case didn't seem quite like science fiction any longer. The cool part of this project is that students create the evidence. Each group submits a piece of evidence to me, the judge. Once evidence is accepted, it gets a stamp of approval. It's considered valid and new evidence can't contradict it. This part can get a little tricky because as the judge, I need to keep close track of the evidence. The students surprise me each year with new evidence that's often pretty creative. They always do extra research to learn more about genetics to help their case. This pedigree chart, for instance, was designed to show that Jen didn't have a high probability of having artistic genes in the first place. This document was a letter of reprimand to David Alleel, Promo's new lead scientist. His sloppy procedures resulted in a 5% decrease in Chromo's success rate during the year Jen was modified. The CEO of Chromo Labs shows that there is little similarity between the fitness genes and the artistic genes. The blue highlights show the very few sequences that are the same. Cross-referenced with Chromo's success rate, he demonstrates the very small chance there could have been a mistake. During the trial preparation, reporters are busy interviewing and writing newspapers. They make short news reports using iMovie to add to the excitement and anticipation of the case. I learned that I need to provide some information to avoid time spent arguing about basic details. I give the students basic info about Jen's date of birth, her parents, and her most recent report card. I'm really pleased with how seriously the students take the project. They love the role playing, dress in business attire for every day they're in court, and work really hard to win the case. They seem to have a lot of fun along the way. I think it gives you a taste of what you might encounter later in your life or our generation. So, I mean, it's not total fiction. And, and working for the parents, like, it kind of, I don't know, gave me a completely different perspective on it because I kind of went into the court case thinking, oh, I'm on the parents' side. This is going to be really, really hard. Like, the parents? Because I didn't think that genetic engineering for a child was really an ethical, right thing to do. But after you do all the work and you research it, and you make up the parents' motives and you think of like why people would do this and why it's necessary and how it can help people, it gives you a, a I mean, you have two different Only perspectives. Perspective. So the way you think about life and genetic engineering is different. Everybody kind of develops their own new attitude. I had to call and, you judge. Yeah, that was weird. It was frustrating. <laughs> Your no, honor. Yeah, you have to embrace it. Um, you can't be like, okay, I'm gonna pretend to be this person and we're gonna do some work and stuff's gonna happen. You kind of have to really embrace the whole style of the court case and like when you do and then you're, you're, you're in it and you're a part of it and it's really fun and you're, you are that person for that 50 minutes every day and that's, you're defending your side. It's fun. Um, I remember questioning Chloe on day two, and I felt really, really sick, and it was really bad, but I didn't want to let him question her, <laughs> because he'd do something wrong. Oh, this is really and good. And I know I had a really good idea, and it worked, and then we won. <laughs> if you blame your parents, how is life going to be after this case with Jen? Have you thought about that?
Improved.